What's up guys? So uh, this has been requested. I did say that I might uh, upload an example of one of these live sessions from Chess Bootcamp Live. Um, so, and somebody said, yes, please do it. So here we go. So <clears throat> one thing we're doing is we are working through, um, well, let me just back up a little bit and tell you a little bit how it works. We, we have four sessions per week, live sessions on Zoom. So you join along with people either sub 750, 750 to 1000, 1000 to 1250, which is our um, intermediate group or the advanced group is 1250 plus. Um, each of them run by a, uh, a, a, an experienced coach who's several hundred points higher rated. So, you know, you've got me, you've got Christina, 1600 rated rapid, James, 1800 rated rapid, and Craig, 2000 rated rapid. Uh, and the point is that you learn, you, you train your chess live with other people rather than sitting there working with a book, sitting there with a board or an engine, which is terribly dull and takes a lot of discipline. But this, this, is, this is fun. This is fun and interactive and social and all of these things. So, you know, these players really get to, you know, to know each other a bit and, you know, we, you know, we really count each other as friends. So um, in addition to those four sessions, I've been running these extra sessions on Sundays, which open to everyone. In fact, all the sessions are really open to, to everyone. You can go along to whichever ones you, you like, um, even if you're not strictly in that, in that band. And we've been working through this book, and this is an incredible book. Um, earning Chernev's Logical Chess Move by Move. It was written and published first, I think, in the 1950s. Uh, but it's since been updated with modern algebraic notation. And he goes through these, these classic games, uh, literally, like the, the title says, Move by Move. And he explains from a master's perspective the logic be behind every single move, whether it's a strong move or problematic move. And... Um, so what you get is you get a, a really intimate understanding. You know, like if you watch, for example, a Gadmato's channel, when sometimes he just whizzes through 10 moves and, and we have this from Carlson and blah, 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 blah. And you go, well, 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 why? You know, what's going on? Well, Chernev takes you through in painstaking detail and with quotes and references about chess principles and stuff like that from other writers, you know, like Steinitz and whatever. Um, it's incredibly useful stuff. So this is what we've been doing. We've been taking one game and then we work through the game and I explain what Chernev says. And uh, yeah, we discuss different things. We look at different sidelines and stuff. But the point is, it's not that you, you know, you learn a sequence of moves. The point is that you, you start to absorb the thought process, why is that move a good move? Why is that move a weaker move, right? So it expands your overall kind of holistic view of chess rather than trying to learn, oh, this is a good thing, this is a bad thing, right? Um, incredibly useful. Anyway, enough talking from me. Figure it out for yourself. Sit back, enjoy. So here is an example. This is the third of these that we've run. And we're just going to keep going through the book because it's absolutely awesome. Uh, yeah, just enjoy. See you later. Okay, guys, so we're going to crack on with our series of games from the, um, the Chernev book, uh, Logical Chess. And we're going to go all the way back to the beginning with game one, which I found really, really fascinating as well. So as before, I'm going to read out all of Chernev's comments. We're going to make the moves. Now, black is the is the victor in this game. So we're gonna watch this, we're gonna work through this from the black side of the board. Okay, and this is um, game played by Von Chev against Teichmann in Berlin, 1907. So just about 115 years ago. And we have a Jocko Piano. Okay, so Chernev starts with an introduction. He says, the chief object of all opening strategy is to get the pieces out quickly off the back rank and into active play. You cannot attack, let alone try to checkmate with one or two pieces. You must develop all of them as each one has a job to do. Right? He puts it very clearly. A good way to begin is to release two pieces at one stroke and this can be done by advancing one of the center pawns. So what do you think White's first move is? What's he referring to? 
I think it's going to be E4. Yeah. Well, we know that because we already said it's the Gioco Piano anyway, so we know ah. it's going to be an Italian game. Okay. This, he says, is an excellent opening move. White anchors a pawn in the centre of the board and opens lines for his queen and his bishop. Right. His next move, if he is allowed, would be d4. Right. The two pawns will then control four squares on the fifth rank, c5, d5, e5, and f5, and prevent black from placing any of his pieces on these important squares. So we'd control all those. Okay. How shall black reply to white's first move? He must not waste time considering mean, uh, meaningless moves such as h6 or a6. Those and other aimless moves do nothing toward developing the pieces, nor do they interfere with white's threat to monopolize the center. And just bear in mind that these pawns are the least useful pawns to move, okay? You've got four bad pawns and four good ones. Let's make those green, okay? And the, the key thing about the good ones is that they relate to the two bishops, okay? So moving any of the red colored pawns here doesn't, doesn't help you to get all your pieces off the back rank and connect your rooks, okay? Anyway, okay. Black must fight. This is an emphasis. Black must fight for an equal share of the good squares. Black must dispute possession of the center. Why all this stress on the center? Why is it so important? Pieces placed in the center enjoy the greatest freedom of action and have the widest scope for their attacking powers. A knight, for example, posted in the center, or even these, right? There, 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 color those in. Um, a knight posted in the center reaches out in eight directions and attacks eight squares. Standing at the side of the board, its range of attack is limited to only four squares. Okay. It's only half a knight. Occupation of the center means control of the most valuable territory. It leaves room for the enemy's pieces. It, sorry, it leaves less room for the enemy's pieces and makes defense difficult, as his pieces tend to get in each other's way. Occupation of the center or control of it from a distance sets up a barrier that divides the opponent's forces and prevents them from cooperating harmoniously. Um, oh, sorry, Ian wants to join as well, so, okay. Uh, resistance by an army thus disunited is usually not very effective. So Black's move is e5. Very good. Black insists on a fair share of the center. He fixes a pawn firmly there and liberates two of his pieces. Hi, Ian. You've joined us at the end of move one from a game from 1909 or something. Or yeah, it's, it's the first game in the book, isn't it? So I've... Uh... I've already picked up on where you are in the book, so that's fine. Fantastic. Great. <clears throat> okay. So White's uh, second move is the very common knight to f3. Absolutely the best move on the board, says Chernev. The knight develops with a threat, attack on a pawn. This gains time. As black is not free to develop as he pleases, he must save the pawn before he does anything else. And this cuts down his choice of reply. The knight develops towards the center, which increases the scope of his attack. The knight exerts pressure on two of the strategically important squares, e5 and d4. The knight comes into play early in the game in compliance with the precept to develop knights, knights before bishops. One reason for the cogency of this principle is that the knight takes shorter steps than the bishop. Right. Um, it takes longer for him to get to the fighting area. The bishop can sweep the length of the chessboard in one move. Notice how the f1 bishop can go all the way to a6, right. where the knight takes a hop, skip, and a jump to get to b5. Right. So one, two, three. Okay. Um, the bishop makes it in one leap. Bang. Okay. So. Another purpose in developing the knights first is that we are fairly sure where they belong in the opening. We know that they are most effective on certain squares. We are not always certain of the right spot for the bishop. 
we may want the bishop to command a long diagonal, or we may prefer it to have um, we may prefer to have it pin an enemy piece. So bring out your knights before developing the bishops. At this point, you will note that black must defend his e pawn. Um, before going about his business. There are several ways to protect the pawn. He must evaluate and choose from these possibilities. So he's got two f6, got queen f6, queen e7, bishop to d6, um, pawn to d6, and knight to c6. How does black decide on the right move? Must he analyze countless combinations and try to visualize every sort of attack and defense for the next 10 or 15 moves? Let me hasten to assure you that a master does not waste valuable time on futile speculation. Instead, he makes use of a potent secret weapon, positional judgment. Applying it enables him to eliminate from consideration inferior moves, to which the average player devotes much thought. He hardly glances at moves that are obviously violations of principle. Here is what might go through his mind as he selects the right move, okay? F6, terrible. My F pawn occupies a square that should be reserved for the knight, and it also blocks the queen's path along the diagonal. And I've moved a pawn when I should be developing pieces. Okay, queen F6, bad. Since my knight belongs on C6, not the queen, Okay. Um, <clears throat> also, I'm wasting the power of my strongest piece to defend a pawn. Right, so this is the principle that you should use the cheapest possible um, method or piece to, um, to do a job. Okay, so bishop to d6. I've developed a piece, but the d pawn is obstructed and my c8 bishop may be buried alive. d6, not bad, since it does give the c8 bishop an outlet, but wait, it limits the range of the f8 bishop. And again, I've moved to pawn when I should be putting pieces to work. And that leaves us with knight c6, eureka. This must be best, as I've developed a piece to its most suitable square and protected the e-pawn at the same time. Okay. So we play that. Without going into tedious analysis, Black picks out the best possible move. He follows the advice of the Frenchman who said, sortez les pièces, which means bring, bring out your pieces. He brings a piece out and saves the e-pawn without any loss of time. I would caution you that this and other maxims are not to be blindly followed. In chess, as in life, rules must often be swept aside. In general though, the principles governing sound chess play do make wonderful guideposts, especially in the opening, the middle game, and the ending. <laughs> Comedy touch from Chernoff there. Okay, so white now plays bishop to c4. The best attacking piece is the king's bishop, says Tarash. So white puts this piece to work and clears the way for early castling. The bishop seizes a valuable diagonal in the center and attacks black's f7 pawn. This pawn is particularly vulnerable as it is guarded by one piece only, the king. It is not unusual, even early in the game, to sacrifice a piece for this pawn so that the king, in capturing it, is uprooted, driven into the open, and exposed to a violent attack. Okay. Now, black follows suit with bishop to c5. Chernov says, is this the most suitable square for the bishop? Let us look at alternatives, all right? Bishop to b4, inferior, because black's bishop takes no part in the struggle for control of the center and has little scope here, all right? So here, the bishop is literally, he's not touching any of these key squares in the center. Right, that's the center, and the bishop has no influence over it. That's the key thing. Here, at least, the bishop is controlling one of the four central squares. Okay. Um, so, what about bishop to d6? 
poor, since the d-pawn is blocked and Noah and the other bishop may have trouble coming out, obviously, which we've already said. Bishop e7, this one. Not too bad because the bishop looks out on two diagonals and is well placed for defense. At e7, the bishop has made only one step forward, but it has been developed once it's left the back rank. The most important thing to remember is that every piece must be put in motion. The strongest developing move is bishop to c5. On this excellent square, the bishop commands an important diagonal, exerts pressure on the center, there, um, and attacks a weak pawn. This deployment conforms to two golden rules for opening play. One, place each piece as quickly as possible on the square where it is most effective. And two, move each piece only once in the opening. White's primary object, oh, so here we go. White plays pawn to c3. White's primary object is to establish two pawns in the center. And with this move, he intends to support an advance of the d-pawn. Right, so this is very similar to the last game that, that we looked at, you know, with this c3 push preparing d4. And this is the main line, actually, of the Joko piano. Um, attacking bishop and pawn. So that's what he wants to do. He wants to attack here, which we did see last week. And that game, white one. Black must then reply, e takes d4. Recapture by c takes d4 leaves white with two pawns in control of the center. White's secondary aim is to bring the queen to b3. Hang on, here. By intensifying the pressure on the f7 pawn. Right, interesting. These are its virtues, but there are drawbacks to 4c3. Um, so, what can you think of... So, yeah, there's a couple of drawbacks that Jen have mentioned. What, what do you guys think they, they are? Why, what are the downsides of this move? Stops the development of the uh, um, B pawn, the white's B pawn. Uh, B knight, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the knight is not, uh, doesn't have its natural square. Yeah. And the other thing we've, we've, well, kind of two related things that we've already mentioned. C pawn, right? C pawns are actually, you know, they're not the most helpful because they're in this group, right? In that they don't, it doesn't help development. Plus what Chenev says, in the opening pieces, not pawns should be moved, right? So in another of these games, we saw the idea that you should only move pawns in the opening if it assists with development. And this one doesn't assist with development. It does, however, assist with control of the center. Okay, so black now plays. I mean, can you think of, well, what would you play as, as black here, do you think, with considering that you're anticipating this move coming with queen here and bishop with a barrage on f7? What candidate moves could we have? I think um, Queen E7 is a candidate move. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I have to say, I do sort of end up in similar positions like this, and I it does often give me some trouble, but uh, I think Queen E7 tends to be the only solution practically that I can find often. Yeah, Queen E7 is the move that is played. Correct, well done. Very good, he says. So Chen F approves, Pete, he's with you. Black develops a piece while parrying the threat. Um, so, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we quite often say, well, you wanna get your minor pieces out before you get your queen out. However, we have a, an immediate tactical threat, right? And also, it's not like you've thrown your queen out somewhere stupid. You've, you've, you've got the queen off the back rank, 
but you are adding a defender to that, you're adding a defender to that, you're adding a defender to that, right? So the queen is actually exerting a lot of useful um, influence, I would say, um, primarily in the defensive capacity. Okay. You're also covering G5, uh, potential knight move, right? Yeah, yeah. well, this pawn hasn't moved for sure. Okay, I said, because as well, practically speaking, right, what you would really want is is somehow to have been able to play d5, which isn't an option, or to have your bishop on, say, e e6, but without the queen out, you know, you, you can't get the bishop there defended anyway. Yeah, it takes two moves. Yeah, and, and it takes two moves to do that in, in either event, and you sort of need to counter the threat immediately. So it's... I've always found that Queen E7 is the only way to sort of do yeah. this. But if, you that, did, if you did this, yeah. Queen comes out to there. Right? Even if you play this, yeah, it's gone. Yeah, you drop B7 anyway. You know, yeah. so yeah, completely right. Queen E7 is the move. <clears throat> um, so it's if, a lot of interest then. Ben. Yeah. If you end up with your knight going on to A5, I know knights on the rim. Oh no, it takes away your defender. It's all right. I can see why now. Because although that then protects or well, stops the queen coming out onto uh, B3, it takes away the defender of the other pawn, which is probably more important at this moment. Although, say, oh, that, for, yeah, as, as this this idea. Yeah. yeah. We should, we should, let's put eval on and, and see. In fact, we can leave eval. Well, that won't work here, right? Because they can just push the uh, four, right? It's gone shot up from 0 0.1 to 2.7. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, you get four. Because you've undefended this or... No, no, it's, it's B4, right? D4. It, no, B, B4. Oh, yes. Yeah, good spot. Oh, it's no. not. No. Blunder. It's not that. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, of Why? course, yes, because it hangs the bishop. Yeah, you got to hang. This bishop is currently yeah. hanging. Oh yeah. yeah. Although you may do an exchange. Yeah, there must be something here tactically, though. There was a better move, though. Is it the bishop takes? That's it. That's it. And then grab, grab the bishop. Yeah. All yeah, right. Because the other way around, you know, if if we just grab the bishop, that's an equal trade. Yeah. Yeah. And this way. Slip. This way, we get the king off the mark, and and we get a pawn. Yeah. So getting the king off the mark, you know, in a lot of people's views, is worth half a pawn or a pawn in itself. But yeah, interesting thoughts, guys. Um, if white persists in playing five d four now, right? The continuation. Okay. So let's let's see how it works out. Right. So. If white was to play this now, okay, what's the continuation? E takes d4, mm -hmm. c takes d4, and okay, and knight now what? Takes. I think um... knight takes, then queen takes. So if you play knight takes, oh, sorry, yeah, the knight takes the white pawn, then that'll probably be. Taken by White's Knight, and then you can put the Queen up onto check from a black point of view. So you would have from well, here. Black Black actually has, has a more forcing moves than capturing this pawn. Just go straight for the. Um, yeah, we could take that check. pawn right there. Yeah, Queen takes here with check. Yeah, this capture with check gives White no time to recover the pawn. And, an, and now we've got three attackers as well on here. Okay. Which we didn't before. Um, everything else being equal, it is enough to win the game. Mm. Sorry, he says an extra pawn, everything else being equal, is enough to win the game. So white doesn't do this. Okay. Um, instead, white castles. Okay. So I'm going to promote this variation. So this is the main line. This is what actually happens. White postpones the advance of the d-pawn. 
and moves his king to a safer place. Okay, and the principal Jenner says is castle early in the game, preferably on the king's side. Okay, so now moves for um, for black. I'd be looking to uh, push the deep pawn to develop your um, white bishop or bring your knight out to f6 as a standard um, okay. developing moves. Yeah. And so the move that's played is d6. Bang on. Strengthens the center and supports the e pawn and the bishop. Now the c8 bishop can get into the game. Okay, white now plays d4. Okay, because the king's no longer on e1. So, you know, there's no issue. Well, it's less of a, a danger. This pawn is still actually technically undefended. So what, we've got three attackers on this pawn, three defenders. So there's no real advantage to be gained. In fact, that and then c takes, it may be better for us, but we'll see. Well, isn't the problem, though, that one of their three defenders is a pawn and none of our three attackers would be a pawn? So, Yeah, our, our first attacker would be a pawn. So right, but... okay, so pawn takes, pawn takes, and then bishop has to retreat, which, yeah. which we saw in last week's game. I think something like that, wasn't it? Yeah. Anyway, so... Um, so he plays d4 with the hope that black will exchange pawns. White wants black to exchange pawns here. This would leave white with an impressive lineup in the center. Like that. Okay. Uh, while the c3 square is now available for the knight. So if now e takes d4, c takes d4, queen takes e4. Ah, what's wrong with that move? And why is the eval bar just gone? Bit of a whoopsie. Yeah, a bit of a whoopsie. Look, because of that. Okay. White punishes the pawn snatching with a rookie one pinning the queen. Okay. So he says, but black need not capture. All right. So alternative move for black, guys. And the bishop really back to B6. Yeah. There's only one move. It's pretty much forced because the bishop yeah. can't get there, there or there. Right. Okay, black need not capture. Now that his e-pawn is secure, the bishop simply retreats, still bearing down on the white center from its new position, okay? So he's still looking at this pawn and also potentially x-raying the king, okay? Despite its formidable appearance, white's pawn center is shaky. The d-pawn is attacked three times and white must keep a triple guard on it Okay, while trying to complete his own development. On seven, queen b3, which he contemplated earlier, the queen's protection would be removed, while on uh, move seven, knight b to d2, so in case of, of this move, um, keep losing my place when I go, okay, it is cut off. So he's actually blocked the queen's defense of that pawn as well. So that move isn't really viable because he would lose the pawn and lose his central control. Meanwhile, white is faced with a threat. Okay. Um, so thinking with this in mind, three attackers, right? Three defenders. How, can, how could black, what threat does black have that could increase pressure on this pawn or effectively eliminate a defender of this pawn? What, what ideas can you think of? I mean, I think um, bishops. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Bishops to uh, G, G4. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least temporarily removes one of the defenders. Yeah, so it, it would paralyze this knight because obviously the sequence has to go. You capture back first. Well, I mean, he, he can't recapture with the king. The first recapture have to be either the pawn or the knight, right? Um, and if, if pawn takes, we just take it. And then the knight can't recapture because it's pinned on the queen. 
Yeah. But, and I think the difficulty here for White is that once that move is played, you know, you might want to play something like, uh, I don't know, Queen D, D2 for White to sort of unpin the knight. But as soon as you do that, uh, taking the knight then causes huge problems for White because they have to... Yeah, this is still a problem, isn't it? Because then Pawn has to recapture. Yeah. So, uh, before committing himself to a definite course of action, White sets a little trap with Pawn to A4. Okay. He says, a tricky move, but an Ill illogical one. White threatens an attack on the bishop, okay, with what? What's he thinking of? He's going to push the pawn again. Yeah. Pawn a5 would trap the bishop because the bishop can't go there. And, he, and he's got no retreat squares. Actually, that's a pattern that I don't think I've ever thought about in a chess game. You know, but I, I'm I'm very very. I don't use my a pawn very much at all. I I know this, you know. I need to use it more often in conversation. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's sound, which is why I don't do it. But I've seen it used a lot. As in, you know, I've faced it a lot. Right. I was going to say in the London uh, one of the London um, variations that's actually used as a um, killer move. It's actually the it's the, the excellent move that actually. Helps win the game uh, when you're when you're looking at the, um, uh, the exactly the queen being on that diagonal. So yeah. if you push the um, the a pawn um, would be blacks. So um, it sits right in the in the way. So if the queen was to come down, you'd just snatch it with that, or the bishops to come down because I think they're actually in line with each other. The thing it just takes it just adds that complexity to the game because that rook's right there waiting to come up and snatch it. Mm. But guys, if this is played A5, right? If if A5 is played, okay, how many attackers and defenders would there be on that pawn? Uh there'd be uh yeah, that's right. There'd yeah. be two attackers, one defender. Okay, so let's say we did something like this, right? and pushed, okay, it, it favours white. So why can't we just eliminate the pawn with like this? Why is it dropped down to 4.1? I'm not sure that that works, right? Because you, first of all, you could, though, hmm, you can pin the knight. We're losing control of the center. Uh, if we have to, right? It, it, it all the focus is coming off the D four pawn at that point, right? But isn't the bigger problem that say Bishop B five pins the knight, and then the, your bishop is hanging? That's one way of looking at it. There's there's an even cruder tactic than that, right? And it is it's a tactical. It's a very very short range tactical issue. Right, the problem is this. D5 just hits the knight, threatens to remove the only defender of the bishop, and the knight, if the knight moves anywhere, and to be honest, it's only got one option, the bishop falls. So that would be terrible. Um, what, about, what about knight takes? It's not that much better, is it? Well, what you can do here is presumably... Rook takes knight, and then when bishop recaptures, you've got check with the queen picking up the bishop, and you've got a bishop and a knight for a rook. Exactly. Excellent. That's it. That's exactly what Jenna puts in the book. Yeah, double attack, check, and and that. So yeah, even if something like this, again the bishop is lost, and White's just simply in a winning position again. Excellent. Okay, so so that doesn't work. In fact, we're going to go back here. So a4 is played. All right, so, but what right has white to play combinations when his development is so backward? All right, he's still got this going on. And it, an attack such as he initiates here is premature and should not succeed. 
right? Shenev says, in emphasis, so I'm going to add a, a wagging finger, it says, develop all your pieces before starting any combinations, he says. That's, that's, that's me talking in italics, okay? So... <laughs> I do think that's a great, great point, though, and not one to be taken lightly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unless you've got some kind of winning idea, like bishop takes f7 check, or oh no, my queen, I'm going to checkmate you, right? You don't start messing around with tactics. It's got to be a really powerful tactic. And a lot of us are guilty, I know, of engaging in... Um, just poking tactics rather than, you know, chopping off your head tactics too early in the game. Anyway, yeah. so this is a mistake, according to Chenov. Okay, so move for black. You know, this is um, a threat. It's a real threat, so we must do something. I'd go knight. A A5. Yeah. I would go with knight to uh, A5. Friends the bishop as unprotected. Well, okay. But then I'm the pawn is that not move, I mean, We're moving a I developed mean, piece. Work. You know, why do we want to move a developed piece twice? Do we want to... Is our knight better off here or on the rim? No? Um, and, you know, is it a winning tactic? You know, to is it a good idea to develop a second time? Probably not. Yeah. So the move that's actually played by black is just oh, quite no. a six. Yeah. A, a five would have been playable as well. But this puts the pawn on this square rather than this square. Okay. So on, on here, it's, it's defended by a brother pawn. Right. If you moved it all the way to a five, it's defended by pieces. Right. And again, we should be using the cheapest possible, you know, material or resource to perform a job, okay? Also, maybe on a5, there's a, there's a possibility of this, I don't know. But he, he pushes a6, so let's hear the, uh, the, the reasoning. Black prepares a retreat for his bishop. This does not violate the precept about making unnecessary um, pawn moves in the opening. Uh, James, do, do you want to join live, mate? Is it? Okay, let me bring James in. Brilliant. Okay, does not violate the precept about making unnecessary poor moves in the opening. Development is not meant to be routine or automatic. Threats must always be countered first. If more justification is needed, consider that Black's loss of time is compensated for by White's fruitless A4 move. Okay, and White now pushes A5. Why do you think White made that move? He's got plans to start doing a pawn storm, so pushing the uh, B pawn. No, Maybe again, it's, next, it's kind of a... Queen. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, the queen on... Um, yeah. This idea. Yeah. Paints the knight. Uh, maybe. Um, what Chenev says is that, that he's hoping that Black's going to play this mm. and then fall for this tactic, right? He says there is just a wee chance that Black will be tempted to take the pawn. But Black does not take the pawn. So what do we do instead? Bishop to a7. Yeah. Bishop a7. Black does not bite. The eval has actually gone slightly in White's favour here. Okay. Yeah. I, I was actually going to ask Ben and maybe James. I don't know what your view on this, but I, I, I don't know when China wrote this book. It's it it's a relatively old book, nineteen fifties. Right? Yeah, I, I do wonder whether it was written today. Whether actually the view would be that that um, a a six wasn't the right move and that a five was, because I do think there's a more modern sort of tendency to. To meet at a a four with a six almost a five sorry immediately yeah well we can we can put lines on here and see computer uh, still it, prefers uh, a a a six there you go yeah an a five interesting yeah 
It is. Okay, so... Uh, the reaction, sorry, to that sort of move is always to unthinkingly push A5. So it's interesting to see that that's not necessarily the right answer. Mm, yeah. I mean, that's, that might be something to analyse. Yeah. So he pushes, pushes, and I'll promote that variation. Um, by the way, this is in the Leachess study as well, so you can go over this again at your leisure with all the comments in it. Okay. Black does not bite. White now pushes H3. Okay. What are your thoughts on this move? Before it's, I tell you Chernev's thoughts on it's this. It's prophylactic, right? Mm hmm Preventing bishop G4. Okay. Now, again, right? Did One thing that it? we had this in lesson, uh, Bob, did, didn't we have this? Sorry, uh, Ian, we, we had a lesson, didn't we, the, the other week? This idea about, okay, if the bishop comes to G4, then can I play the kick, right? It's, it's, like, it's like a pre-kick. Yes. You know? So if the bishop comes here, then I can play H3. And if he wants to trade off, queen takes, and, you know, we've, we're, we're ahead, you know? Isn't this thing to be a, what they call a waiting move? Well, Chernev's comment is, a coffee house move. <laughs> How rude. <laughs> Weak players make this move instinctively in dire dread of having a piece pinned. It is better to submit to the pin a temporary inconvenience than to prevent it by a move that loosens the position of the pawns, defending the king, and weakens the structure permanently. Brilliant. Playing h3 or g3 after castling creates an organic weakness that can never be remedies. remedied, as a pawn once advanced cannot retreat, and the position once altered cannot be restored. The pawn that has moved forward itself becomes a target for direct attack, what we call in modern terms a hook, yeah? While the square it guarded earlier, here being G3, becomes a landing field for the enemy's troops. You should never unless of necessity or to gain an advantage, move the pawns in front of the castle king, says Tarash, for each pawn move loosens the position. Alakine expresses it even more strongly. Always try to keep the three pawns in front of your castle's king on their original squares as long as possible. Black can now speculate on breaking up white's kingside by removing the h3 pawn, even at the cost of a piece. The, the recapture tears open the g-file, right? So if we take, for example, with the bishop, recapture tears open the g-file and exposes white's king to attack. This, pl this plan is, of course, not to be put into action until what, guys? The 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 so again, the and our king is safe. Yeah. Well, what Jenna says, not to be put into action until more pieces are brought into play. Remember, you can't beat your opponent with one or two pieces. Very, very difficult to do. Okay. So he's not using this this bishop. He's certainly not using this knight. He might need a rook, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, okay. Also, this knight's a long way away. Okay. So, candidate move for black. I have some ideas. Well, uh, knight, the yeah, the, the knight have uh, have uh, yeah, yeah, correct. Knight, knight, knight f six is, is the move that's played. The knight swings into the fray with an attack on the e pawn, yeah. which remember is undefended in this Choco piano thing, right? This move is excellent and conforms with a useful general principle. Develop with a threat wherever possible. And that's a really, really good one to remember, right? Remember that to meet the threat, the opponent must drop whatever else he is doing. Okay? So, white plays, D takes E5. White exchanges, ooh, and opens up lines for his pieces. Unfortunately, this reacts in Black's favor. 
in accordance with the rule in these cases. Open lines are to the advantage of the player whose development is superior. Okay, open lines are to the advantage of the player whose development is superior. Okay, so move for black. Knight to c5, friend in the bishop, or going to kick the bishop. Uh, that's c5. Uh, sorry, e5. Yeah, correct. Knight takes e5 is the move. You guys are on fire today. Much stronger than like, taking with the pawn. Okay, The knight on e5, remember we just mentioned that this knight's actually quite a long way away from the action area, yeah? The knight on e5, beautifully centralized, radiates power in every direction, something a pawn cannot do. The disappearance of white's d pawn has benefited what piece? Look, from here. And what has suddenly become monstrous? The um, dark square bishop. Yeah, look at this guy. All the way over the other end of the board. Sniper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. That's a high-powered sniper, right? Lot that can shoot you dead a mile and a half away. Right? It's benefited Black's bishop hidden away at A7. Its range has been extended so that it now controls the whole of the long diagonal, leading to White's F2 pawn, and the king is just behind the pawn. What shall White do now? He has done nothing to relieve the plight of his E pawn. Right? It's still attacked by one of Black's knights, while his bishop is threatened by the other. Yeah? What a jellyhead, writes Chernev. He doesn't actually say that. It was I added that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to okay, say so that sounded more like a bend than a... Yeah, yeah. I'll hold my hand up to that. Okay. White now <laughs> trades knights. Okay. He says, this looks plausible as White gets rid of a powerfully placed piece. But in making this exchange, right, what's, what's the big downside of this? Think positionally, strategically. We've got a hanging knight, right? Well, I mean, yeah, but, you know, he, he's just initiated a, a, an equal trade. So either queen or pawn is going to take... But remember, just going back to, you know, what when Chernev talks about why do you develop your knight to this square, what's the one of the key reasons? You know, you develop your knight to F3, for example, to control the center, blah, 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 right? But also because this knight, especially if you, yeah. you know, your king's knight, it's got an important defensive role. So he says white's, in doing this, white's own F3 knight the best defender of the castle position also comes off the board. The importance of holding on to the knight in such situations was pointed out by Steinitz more than 70 years ago when he said three unmoved pawns on the king's side in conjunction with a minor piece form a strong bulwark against an attack on that wing, right? And white has already sinned twice here. He's moved the H pawn, Right, he blinks and did that completely unnecessarily. And now he's given up his knight. Okay, so how do you recapture? Queen. Correct. Yeah, queen takes. Observe that white's knight has disappeared completely from the board, but black's knight has been replaced by another piece. Yeah? So from here, this knight now disappears, right? And black still has a central piece, still attacking this pawn now twice, right? And it's a bit like, you know, when you have like rooks staring each other down an open file, you know, you, you, you don't want to be the one to initiate the trade because your opponent then replaces the captured piece with the same piece. So it's a very similar kind of pattern there, I think. He says the new piece, the queen, is magnificently posted at e5. She dominates the center, 
bears down on the hapless e-pawn and is poised for quick action on any part of the board. How does white solve the problems posed by the position of the menacing queen and the attacks on his e-pawn? He would love to dislodge the queen with 12 f4. But unfortunately, what's wrong with that move, guys? It's can't because it puts a, it's an illegal move. It's an illegal move. Yeah, it, it won't even let me do it. I, I try and do it. It won't let me do it because the pawn's pinned. Okay. See the power of this bishop, right? So he'd love to do that, but it's illegal. Can he save the pawn? Okay, so he plays knight to d2. Right, and what what piece on white side of the board now looks completely stupid? The queen and the bishop. Yeah, this bishop <laughs> still hasn't moved, right? Yeah. Has not entered the fray at all. This bishop, what, what do you think about this bishop? I mean, is that bishop equally stupid? No, because he, he's got a job to do. He wants to go and rob that uh, h-pawn. So opening the king. Exactly. It's like Naroditsky says. A, a, a bishop can be considered developed even if it hasn't moved. If the bishop actually exerts influence over the board, it's as though it's developed, okay? So he says, desperately hoping that black will snatch the pawn, right, with this move. So what would be wrong with this? So white is playing a, quite a bit of hope chess here by the sound of it. It would allow him to develop his knight and which would uh, essentially release the bishop and put it in play, right? Think even uglier than that. He'll put the knight back into f3, threatening the queen, and force the queen to move. Knight back to f3, yeah, kind of. No, even, even more blunt yes, and brutal. He'll run into a similar sort of whoopsie, right, where the rook slides over. The knight is pinned. Yes. Oh, uh, and he would he would take the queen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you and then he's he's dead, way. right? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that knight capturing there looks like just about the worst move on the board for black. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But black is too smart for this, right? Okay, desperately hoping that black will snatch the pawn with knight takes, followed by knight takes, queen takes, and rook e1, and the pin wins the queen. But black is not interested in grabbing pawns. His positional superiority is great enough to justify looking for a combination that will conclusively force a win. His bishops exert terrific pressure on their respective diagonals. Yeah. And let's... You see the lengths that Black took to keep this bishop on this diagonal, right? It's made three moves, but it's occupied three different squares without leaving that, that diagonal, okay? Um, even though one bishop is still technically undeveloped, each of them attacks a pawn shielding the king. Black's queen is ready to swing over to the king's side, while the knight can leap in if more help is needed. Black controls the center, a condition that Capablanca says is essential for a successful attack against the king. In short, Black is entitled to a winning combination as a reward for his methodical positional play. The question is, is there a target available for the explosion of this pent-up power? So what would you do with the Black pieces, guys? Is it... Is it time, or, or should we? Do, do you remember the previous game when Black castled? Is is that a good move here? Should we develop the bishop? Should we connect the rooks? What should we do? Uh, do we want to take the a three, the h three pawn? Bingo! Black takes out the pawn. He calculates right that it's now time. He has enough firepower leveled at white that it's time to pull the trigger now okay what does white play obviously she takes h3 white must capture the bishop or be a pawn down with nothing to show for it okay move for black queen to g3 
Check. Excellent. Yeah. Can't Taking do. advantage of the bishop. This is pinned. The pawn can't recapture. A crashing entrance. Notice how Black has exploited the two main defects of nine h3 with this unnecessary pawn push. He captured the h pawn itself and utilized the g3 square, right? Okay, so he, the only reason he can come here is because that pawn, I mean, that's this is actually Gary, right? So he's, he's captured Harry and Gary's then gone, gone there, right? He's utilized the g3 square, which was weakened by the advance of that pawn as the point of invasion. Black, uh, white only has one move, I think. King h1. White may not take the queen as his f pawn is pinned. Okay, move for black. Not rocket science. Move Gary. <laughs> yeah, off goes Gary. Um, again, there's only one legal move. Uh, white's only move in return for the sacrifice bishop. Black now has two pawns and the attack. Okay. So, move for black. What's most forcing? What's most threatening? Find a move that threatens mate on the next move. Well, I mean, knight, knight um, g4 threatens mate on the next move. Yeah. Knight g4 threatens queen h2 mate. Exactly. Okay. The queen takes it. Threatens mate on the move. White must guard against the threat at h2. Okay. Or give his king a flight square. If he tries to give his king room with this. Hang on. I need to promote. Just promoted that. Okay. Um, okay, now, if he tries to do this, for example, what's the final move of the game? Is, sorry, but is, is Bishop, um, is, F yeah, his Bishop yeah. comes in and takes it. Checkmate. Beautiful. Just, Defended by the Knight. Queen, Queen covers everything else. Yeah. Isn't there a quicker mate? If you go back to before the um, white bishop takes uh, the um, Harry pawn, so come back again. Before that move, if the queen goes up to g3, still can't be taken. Yeah. yeah. And the next move after that, after they're going to bring another piece, is to bring the bishop up. Then the next move, surely, then would be push the queen to g two checkmate. Right. Well, we'll check that. I'm then. just not sure what the response be from you would, uh, white. Wouldn't you just go k one king king sorry h one and then? Yeah, but the queen would then just jump forward, wouldn't it? We'll check it in a minute. So let's yeah. see the last couple of couple of moves on this. Okay, so. Um, Now, knight's coming in, move, so moving the rook doesn't work. Okay. So he tries the desperate knight to f3, right? To guard this square, it's defended by that. Okay. Um, to guard h2 and stop mate. How does black conclude the attack? He reasons it out this way. I have captured two of the pawns near the king. If I can remove the third pawn, it will deprive the king of the, its last shred of protection, and he will be helpless. This last defender, the f pawn, is attacked by my knight and my bishop, and protected by his rook and king. I must either drive off one of the defenders or attack the pawn a third time. Okay. How can black do both of those things? Drive away one of the defenders of this pawn, so either the king or the rook, okay, and attack the pawn. Uh, mm. 
And the, it all rests again on this guy here. Yeah, Queen G3 is playable here, right? Queen G3, exactly. Queen G3 check. Again, exploiting this pin. The circumstance of the F4 in this pin. Black attack to the third piece, the queen, right? Forcing King H1. Bishop tanks. Yeah. Oh, no, it wouldn't be because you'd take with the knight, wouldn't you? Well, yeah, it's tempting to take with the knight. It is bishop takes. Yeah, but... It's now if rook takes, it's bang. Yeah. Well, it's interesting how that um, slider changed completely. Yeah. That's, if it, you go back, it was um, white. That's amazing. No, it's still the same. It's interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is oh, it interesting? You then do you have to go back quick to like Queen H three or something? Uh, it could be, but we'll uh, yeah. We'll, I mean, the thing is, it's completely winning anyway, really, isn't it? So, yeah. so Bishop takes. Okay, now the King can't move. Okay, and um, anyway, White resigns at this point. The king uh, must move to the corner and desert the pawn. Yeah, only the rook defends it. Yeah. And bishop takes f2, covers the king's only flight square, that. Um, g1, and prevents him returning there in answer to a check. So basically, any check now, hang on, yeah. that would just win the game. That would be checkmate anyway. Yeah. So he resigns. I was going to say, if, if they just takes the um, bishop, you just jump on it with the knight, and that's checkmate as well. Yeah. So why is the engine eval 0.6? Minus 0.6? Yeah, like I said, I haven't quite got that. Is, is that because when Rook takes... Very confused by that. Huh. Um, and King F8. So basically with perfect play, um, now Bishop F4, what? Attacking the Queen. Yeah. And now... Bishop H5. What? Yeah. No. I, mean, I see this. Because it's, they're going to pin your Queen to the King eventually, if you're not careful. Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> How on earth... White could possibly wriggle out of this. I don't, and then Rook takes Bishop. Okay. And I have. It's, yeah. Knight takes Queen. <laughs> yeah, obviously, you can't move the Knight yet. So from here, wow. Well, but if you go to the see what, what does the computer say? The computer says Queen H3 check. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's almost like you have to keep shuffling around until you get the... Things you want. Castle, anyway. Yeah. Um, so here, what it's saying is that Black's threat was Queen H3 check, Knight H2, um, and then Queen takes H2, mate. Hmm. So, yes, it seems as though white actually has a resource here, um, but only if he finds bishop takes d7, and that takes some proper calculation. So let's, let's go back to your, your idea about, you know, before the bishop's sack, yeah. could we play... Queen to uh, g3. It's saying bishop takes is the best one. Yeah. So we'll look at this idea of a line. And now it's favouring white. King H1. King H1. Okay. And back. now there's, there's no kind of mate. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the queen okay. just has to retreat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, right, you know what comes next, guys? Let's see if we can take it from the top, this time with passion. Okay. <laughs> so. <clears throat> E4, E5, that's me done. Yeah, e4, and you play e5, okay. Knight to f3. Yeah, that's it, yeah. I'll, I'll play the white moves, that's it. Knight f3, okay. Uh, knight to c6. Yeah. 
Uh, Bishop C4. Bishop C5. Yeah. So this is the Italian game. This is the Gioco Piano. Okay. And the move that's played now is C3. And Queen to B7. Yeah. That kind of, it feels unnatural to me, that move, but it's it's the best move. You know, yeah, we should be ready to play the best moves. Castles. Uh, we do we play D D six. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Absolutely. And now White strikes out with D four, hoping that Black will exchange pawns. What do we do? Bishop to B six. Yeah. Correct. And now White throws in a cheapo, as Simon Williams would call it, with A four. And A6. A6 for the escape. Yeah. Okay, and now um, A5. And we simply calmly go... We should buy some. Okay. And white is better here. 1.3. Until this move. Hmm, interesting. Insane. It's, it's sort of, I, I remember seeing that and thinking that's bizarre. Yeah, it's only only gone down very slightly. I think it's because of that whole sort of ridiculous defensive manoeuvre that we got at the end that no human would ever find. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so move, move for black. Um, knight to F6. Yeah. yeah, knight to F6. Excellent. And now... We have pawn takes. pawn takes. And the computer disapproves. The fish frowns. Yeah, knight takes. Uh, C knight, yeah. Yeah, so we've now just improved our knight. Okay. Um, he takes with his knight. Queen. queen takes. And remember, so now we've got this gorgeous centralized queen, right? Ready to cause a load of trouble. There is something hypnotizing about the way Agad Matal on his YouTube channel says captures, captures. Captures, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then we have F, F2 by Carlson. <laughs> I, I sometimes like to uh, open my videos with hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, I'll do it one day. I'll, I'll, paint, I'll paint a big mole on my, on my cheek and <laughs> yeah. That Naroditsky actually does uh, some quite good impressions as well. He, oh, yeah. yeah. He does impressions of uh, uh, Grandmaster Yasser one as well. I know. Yeah. Who's, who's just gorgeous. Like, if you ever want to go to sleep, just put on a Sarawan uh, lecture. <laughs> and, of course, with the pawn, you know, he talks like this. He's like, oh, you can read me a bedtime story any night, Grandmaster. <laughs> Grandmaster. <laughs> okay, anyway, I've lost my place now. Go right. Queen takes e5. <laughs> right, so we're attacking this pawn, and white now plays the very ugly knight d2. But we are not interested in grabbing pawns. We could. Bishop right? takes. And many of us probably would. Bishop takes. Bishop takes. Page three. Big batter boom. Pawn what? takes. What's amazing is that I've rarely seen a sack that I don't like, but I wouldn't have even considered that one. It's yeah. one I'm considered up there a lot of times. Okay. So, and now, stunning move. Ian, you found this one. Yeah, queen to um, g3. Okay. Queen g3 forces king h1. And take um, Gary. Yeah. Okay. Now it's time to bring in reinforcements. And knight to uh, g4. Yeah, knight comes in now. You see how we're using three pieces? It's like this minimum three pieces idea to finish off a, an attack. Okay, knight to g4. Um, the only thing he can try is this. He pulls his knight in, yeah. Queen to g3. Yeah, king back there. And then 
Um, Bishop. So Bishop now to uh, Bishop takes. Yeah, and he resigns. But bizarrely, bizarrely I mean, that's just, bizarrely. That's bonkers. Really uh, yeah, bonkers. I, I would be really interested to um, maybe I'll look it up after this to see the line because obviously it was it was minus five point eight before the bishop yeah. capture. Yes. I because oh, it, it did we did get to eight, quick queen h three, but I I just sort of wonder what the continuation is. So what do you want to see the line? But how white struggles to hold on, or what the computer thinks we should do here? As in, as in, it's now black's move. What is the best move here? Queen uh, h three check for black. Queen h three check. But I, I just was sort of interested to see why essentially it's saying that they're going to drop a rook and a pawn. But the bishop move is the wrong move here, right? According to the fish, yeah. Yeah. What, what, I, I, what, what, is it? what the fish's line is. Yeah, I was going to say, is it simply be the, it's the um, move order. So if the queen went to h3 first, mm. uh, then you put... He um, has to come back, that's forced. Then take with Well, I mean, if, if knight blocks, then it's mate. So the king has to come back. Yeah. Then if you took queen g three check, king h one again. No. All no, right, it's, it's, it's stuck in a perpetual now. Well, it's going to do something though. Because well, the it, it's, it's it's only looking at the draw. <laughs> yeah, it's going to end up in a draw if it carries on along that line. Which is why I guess it, we've gone down this route. Well, I I would kind of go with if you put the queen over. Uh, if you go back back a move, put the queen over and now take the um would the bishop do it now? The bishop sure wouldn't do it. That wouldn't work either. No, because that just wouldn't work. So strange. It is bizarre. <laughs> yeah. 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 We flummox the fish is question. <laughs> That is interesting, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, it seems as though, yes, playing the best engine move would just result in a draw by repetition. It, yeah. It's almost saying, oh, the reason you're ahead is that you can force white into the line where they take on on F7 with check. But is, is this the case of now, if you took the knight onto... Um... F two. Still, see, it just goes back again. Rook takes. Rook takes. Bishop takes. Bishop takes. Yeah. Yeah. And we're slightly better. Yeah. Well, it's just <laughs> again amazing it's how for this thing. Yeah, but that's that's what's missing, isn't it? There is counterplay. If you don't check, keep the checks up. King takes that you. Is bang equal. King F eight is the only move. That's insane. But anyway, anyway, that's not that's not the point. The point is we've learned a lot of um, little intricacies about move choice. But yeah, feel free to analyze the end of this game to your heart's content. But uh, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off. Good to see you, James. Have you got this book? Thank by you, the way? Have you been through this book, James? Oh, I can't hear you. That's the. Uh, Logical Chess by Irving Chernev. Really, really cool. All right, guys. Have a great oh, day. Really. All right. Anyway, a great session. Thanks, everyone, for yeah. joining. Great this, by the way, I'll let people know if it's any good. It's the Silman book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've got Keep that. I haven't, I haven't managed to get through it. Okay. Cheers, See guys. You guys. Catch you all. All right.